Hey, good morning, everyone. Glad you're here with us on this Sunday morning. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas celebration. And uh, now we're moving on, of course, into the new year, and uh, hopefully it'll be a new year. Um, hey, a few things to let you know about. First of all, as always, uh, fill out your connection card. Let us know that you're with us in, this morning. And uh, there is still time to uh, give uh, towards our year-end giving. So if you want to be a part of that, we deeply appreciate you doing that. And and again, as always, the address is shown here, um, and you can send your gifts to our P.O. box, and uh, so we appreciate you doing that. Thanks to all of you who have done that so far. Deeply, deeply appreciate your giving and, and, uh, and are grateful for that. And then one other thing to let you know about is uh, on January the 10th, we're going to start our backyard groups uh, back up again. And uh, so we'll be meeting at uh, the Russo's home and, and uh, the Keo's home. And if you're interested in being a part of that, let us know. You can let us know through the connection card, and we would appreciate that. Um, this morning, uh, I had asked uh, Dan if he would be willing to preach for us today, and he's going to be doing that. But before we get into that, Crystal's going to sing some songs with us. So why don't you join in and sing some songs? Let's sing together. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt.
that we couldn't leave this song out this Christmas season. This is one of my favorite songs, and I know it's the Sunday after Christmas, but I wanted to include it um, as we wrap up this year because I think it has such a beautiful reminder for us that God is the light of our world. And it is in him that we find hope and we find peace. And it is my prayer that we would carry those things into this new year. So let's sing this song together. The world waits for a miracle. The heart longs for a little bit of hope. Oh, come. Oh, come. child prays for peace on earth and she's calling out from a sea of her oh come oh come Emmanuel and can you hear the angels sing Heavenly Father, we are just in awe of you, and God, maybe we just be reminded as we enter into a new year that you are our guiding light, that there are a lot of things that try to push us into different directions, and yet you remain constant. So God, may we look to you in this upcoming year. May we draw closer to you. 
um, and maybe just try to live a life that honors you. We love you so much. And all of you people said, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. How are we all doing today? Um, there's something that's been kind of interesting that's been happening since the pandemic has been going on. Um, I've basically been at every single service, um, even though I haven't even been on camera. I've been literally right there behind it every single week. I've edited every single one of these from the very beginning. Easter, like, oh my gosh. I, I was up until like, I think 2.30 2 in the morning trying to make sure that we had an Easter service out there. It's been, it's been a really, really wild ride. And I, I have edited every single message and I have probably watched them all at least three times. And I have heard Jim Mann's voice more than anyone on earth ever should, except for Terry Mann, maybe. And I keep trying to tell him that his messages, like they're not like The Office. They don't get any better the more that you watch them. Still doesn't listen to me, and it's very frustrating. And let me tell you, it's as bad as you think. So um, the problem, though, is that, um, you know, I, I can't see you, you can't see me. We're a little disconnected. And it's like we're all doing church in our own little pods all over the place. And in some respects, that kind of feels like we are on our own, that there's nothing else that's happening, that we are completely isolated. And that's actually not what's happening. When I was when I started Bible college, you know, many years ago, um, I was not really good at um, seeing the whole picture. And some of you may argue that I'm still kind of like that right now. Um, but I had this kind of youthful exuberance. And, and my view of church at that particular time was essentially that it was just like what was right there in front of you. It wasn't anything else. It was just this one thing, and you don't need to look back at, at the beginning. You don't need to do, I mean, we have the Bible, and that's fine, but, you know, that's kind of what we're stuck with. And I kept having to go to these church history classes, and I was just like, oh, I don't really want to do this. And, um, you know, my professors would, you know, kind of trying to drill down that, like, it was important. It was important, and I, I couldn't really understand that. And if uh, a little while into that, we started looking at something called the communion of the saints. And that was like the first point that any of these things really kind of hit for me. And we don't necessarily need to go down that rabbit hole too much, but it basically boils down to that every believer is a part of the body of Christ. And when we do things like we pray, we read the Psalms, we sing worship songs or hymns or any of those things, we're doing what every believer, living and deceased, has done. And we're essentially doing church with them kind of at the same time. And if you think of things that way, it's really really connecting to this global and kind of eternal body of believers that's ever existed. Now, some, some denominations even go even further than that, and they actually um, pay attention to something called the liturgical calendar, and their services are actually going through the exact same verses as all the other churches that are going along with the liturgical calendar. And to me, that's, that's even more amazing. And kind of what happened through all of this is it sort of impressed upon me the need to go back now, the, the thing that's interesting about going back and, and referencing, we kind of did this at the beginning of the pandemic. Jim was reading a lot through uh, some of the, the words that Martin Luther had written about the plague that was happening in his time. Certainly, we have the Bible. Um, one of the things that we can't really do with this is we can't really look at those situations, things like that happened in the Bible or things that happened before. We can't necessarily look at those things like, you know, like a Haynes automotive manual. For those of you that aren't really... Um, aware of what that is, you can buy these manuals, they're pretty thick, and they will give you step-by-step -step instructions how to fix anything on a particular car. It's not really like that. It's probably more like an Ikea manual where it kind of like, it gives you the general gist of how to assemble something. So what we kind of do is we look at the past, we extrapolate like the morals or something that happened there, and then we try to apply that today. And the more that we do that, the more that we learn. And I find that for myself, I continuously go back. And that's kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to have a little bit of a church lesson, and we're going to try and 
or a church history lesson, and we're going to try to pull that into our own time. Now, earlier this year, I had an online interaction with Tim Peck. He is the pastor, um, the senior pastor at Glenkirk Church in Glendora. He's preached here at North Hills several times, and um, I was a little like flummoxed and flabbergasted over something, and he suggested that I read a book called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. Um, and I, you know, Tim is probably one of the smartest people that I've ever met, and I ordered the book immediately and was just just absolutely um, captivated by it. Um, it's, it's written by a man named Alan Kreider. He's a, a Mennonite missionary. He's a Bible college uh, professor and scholar. Um, and he was asking one simple question. And I generally find that the simple questions actually have the most difficult answers. The question that he was asking was how the early church grew like a weed. And it really did. It grew faster than anyone thought that it would. And, and the, the thing that's really interesting is that the church at that time was seeing some of the most adversity that it would ever see. And it would continue to grow. And What's really interesting is that if you look at most religions that have ever existed, they don't really go any, anywhere beyond sort of this regional hold that they have over a tribe or a group of people. They generally don't expand to get to every single continent on earth. And even these single God religions, the things that we know as monotheistic, um, those are, we really only have three of those that have survived, and there have been many, many more, and those three would be Christianity, um, Islam, and Judaism. Now, at this particular time, with the early church, the first 400 years, you kind of really couldn't talk about church in public. You couldn't talk about God in public, especially, you know, once you got into sort of like it being illegal in Rome and... and um, Followers of Jesus were being killed on a regular basis. They were actually being put into the gladiator games where they could be attacked by wild animals. So you weren't exactly going to go out and, you know, invite somebody to church because if you did that on a whim, if you didn't know who the person was, or even if you did know who the person was and they showed up to your, your living room gathering that you were having, you could find out that you would soon be snuggling with the teeth of a lion and that wouldn't be good in any way, in any shape or any form. So you can't talk about your faith. You can't tell somebody about the love of Jesus. So what do you do? It's a really, really complicated question. Now, I think it's easy to just say, well, God was in the midst of that. And I, certainly he was, but I think that that sort of dis, does some disservice to what was actually happening. We've all heard this phrase before. Where it says, you know, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. I think that's, a nice saying, but I don't think it actually gets into the practicality of what this actually looks at. So really the question I think that we should look at first is what did it look like then? What did the what was the world like for you know those those periods of time? Um what we actually find when we go there is that you had a, a society that was in a hurry. They were extremely impatient. They were very self-serving. They were concerned with instant gratification. Has nothing to do with what we have now, right? It's actually way more applicable than I ever thought it would be. So the early church, what they chose to do was really just to be the complete opposite of that. They were patient. They were compassionate. They were in the midst of the community. They were looking for any need that they could meet, and they were going out when they were meeting that. They were showing the love of God practically every single day. The church concentrated on something that became known as their witness. Essentially, what that boils down to is their public image the thing that people saw, their reputation inside of the community, that became incredibly important. They made sure that their habits, the things that they did every single day as a reflex were the things that were reflecting the image of God on a regular basis, that they weren't slipping up and doing something else. And that really meant that they were going out and they were spending on money on things, maybe on people that were going to hurt them eventually. 
They were paying for pagan funerals, which were essentially pagan worship services. Can you imagine doing that now? It would almost be unheard of. And they were doing this in a way that was kind and generous and not demeaning. And it got really to the point where if somebody need, needed something, they were going to the Christians for the help because they knew that these people, for some reason, stood apart from everybody else and they were going to be the one that would come to your aid. That's really, really incredibly powerful. So I want to take a moment, talk about love a little bit. Now, love is something that is incredibly important. We all know that, but we don't always get into the mechanics of what it means to show somebody love and how they can actually receive it. So in order to do this, I need to do a little bit of a slight detour here because um, it'll kind of get into things. Um, but this is sort of like a, something that I came across on the internet the other day because that's a fun rabbit hole to go down. And it was this Twitter th thread about people describing their jobs poorly, and I thought it was absolutely hilarious. So I'm going to describe some of these terrible uh, these jobs terribly and uh, kind of give you their definitions. The first one is that I talk to myself in front of large numbers of young people that are busy on their smartphones. To teach her. After a kid tells me where it hurts, I push on that part that hurts while asking if it hurts. It's a pediatrician. Insi this last one is, is a really good one. It says, insisting on silence, I request that you respect the fallen trees. It's a librarian. Now, my version of that is that I try to convince people to do something that they don't really want to do. That's how my job works out, both here at the church um, and at work. At work, at my day job, I'm sort of trying to convince people to spend money on blinking lights that they're going to lock inside of an IT closet and never look at it ever again. And that's really difficult to do. Here, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to convince a group of people that if they change their life in some way, um, that it will be better for it, and it will actually be better for those that are around them. And both of these are, are really difficult things because when you're talking to people about change, that's really, aside from public speaking, that's the last thing that they really want to do. Nobody, absolutely nobody wants to change. So if you are faced with your daily interactions are getting people to change, you kind of got to think about it a lot. And I've done that quite a bit, probably more than I've done a lot of other things in my life, is thinking about what it takes for somebody to change. And I've learned a few things along the way. And the first one I think is probably the most important, and it's that words don't matter nearly as much as we would like them to. Now, certainly words absolutely matter, but it's generally negative words that work really well and positive words that don't really work at all. Um, you know, if you think back to a time in your life where somebody has said something, you know, truly terrible or, in, or insulting to you, you can recall that with vivid detail, just even the emotions that you were feeling, where you were standing, what you were wearing, what you had for breakfast that day, but you can't really remember the nice thing that somebody said to you last night. And it's really because I, I think that the, the bad things make such a, uh, a big impact on us. And when somebody's, somebody pays us a compliment, we kind of feel like they're just, um, they're being polite. And somehow when they say something negative, they're not just maybe being rude or having a bad day, but they actually meant it. And we take those things in. So positive words, unfortunately, they don't tend to matter nearly as much. The second thing that I've learned is that actions carry a weight that's significantly more than what we think that they do. Actions really end up being like the root system of a tree. If something happens to that root system, that tree is going to die or it's going to fall over one of the two. Um, when I was a kid, my dad planted this, uh, well, actually, he planted it before I was a kid, before I was born, before my sister was born. Um, but he planted this cottonwood tree, and cottonwoods grow super, super, super fast. They grow really tall, really quickly, and their root systems expand in really terrible ways, and they, they tend to choke out your... Um, your water lines and your sewer lines looking for uh, water and other nutrients. And uh, my, my, my great-grandfather saw the, the cottonwood going. He's like, you're going to want to get that out of there because that's going to tear up your sewer lines. 
Um, and my mom didn't want to get rid of it, so we kept the tree. And about uh, six or seven years later, when I was about five, um, it got to the point where uh, the tree had, in fact, started to uh, choke out the sewer system. So we had the tree cut down, and then we immediately went on vacation. And when we got back, we had several dozen cottonwoods all over the lot in our house just springing up out of nowhere. That root system was so big and so pervasive that we had these trees just sprouting up out of the ground all over the house, the front yard, the backyard. We thought it was absolutely amazing. But that root system was so deep, it was so powerful that you really couldn't choke it out. The tree just wanted to continue to live on. It was, it was really incredible. Now, actions are, are, are very similar that way. If you use them correctly, they become so powerful, They're, they become so invasive that you can't ever get away from them. And that's really, that works both in, in the positive light and in the negative light. The third thing that I've learned is that you need both actions and words working in harmony to convince anyone of anything. I think we've all been around somebody that has said something to our face very positively. We maybe initially believe them that they're going to do something or be on our side or whatever. And then the next thing that you know, this person is definitely not on your side. They've done something behind your back and it absolutely crushes you. Maybe they've done something to sabotage you directly. There's, a, there's an interesting option uh, here, um, and that's somebody that maybe says something negative to your face, and then they do a bunch of really positive things for you. Now, this is admittedly a, a rarity, but this actually happened in, in my family. My, my grandfather was really like this, master sergeant in the Air Force. He liked being a master sar- sergeant so much that you know, he not only retired once, but he decided to re-up and retire all over again. So he spent basically 40 years in the Air Force. This is my mom's dad. And to your face, this man would never say anything nice to you ever. The best thing that you would get is a sarcastic joke, which says a lot about where I get all of my interactions with people from. And he would, he would talk about you positively. He would brag about you to all of his friends, but he would never say it to your face. Now, to my mom and his kids, he was... Um, particularly rough on because that's what master sergeants do, especially when you've been a drill sergeant. You kind of treat everybody like a recruit. And um, it got to the point where my mom had really no good thoughts about my grandfather in any way. And as she started to think about her life and everything that was going on, eventually she started to put things into perspective. And she told me this story a couple of years ago. It's really changed my life in a lot of ways, I think, because it's, it's, it's helped me kind of understand love and particularly the love of God a lot more. Um, my mom and, and my grandfather really got along like oil and water. Um, they would get into really loud and heated arguments. And at one point, um, my mom was telling me that, that she was having a fight with my grandfather over the phone. This is um, probably really late 70s before um, my sister and I were born. And um, they're yelling at each other. They're very vocal, very animated. And she sort of ends the conversation with, well, I guess then we don't ever need to talk again then, do we? She shouts that at him. And he thought that that was a great idea. And um, then they both hung up the phone on each other. And uh, my mom kind of was telling me that she was really convinced that she was just never going to see her dad ever again, and that was perfectly fine with her. So the next day, her, her and my dad lived here in, in Rancho Cucamonga, and they uh, commuted down to Brea every day for work. They were carpooling, even though they worked at different companies. They worked the same schedule. They were pretty close to each other. So they were commuting home from work when their car died in front of the Shell station that was around the corner from my grandparents' house. Now, this is the 1970s. There's no cell phones. Um, it's, you know, well after five. So the the gas station at this, or the, the garage at this shell was closed. They didn't have any tools. They didn't really even have any money. The only thing that they had was a little bit of change. So my mom knew the only option that they had, aside from sleeping in the car that night, was to call her dad. Because he was the only one that was going to answer the phone. And he was really the only one that could help. 
but that meant swallowing her pride, but I guess she was going to have to do it. So she walks over to the payphone, she puts her money in, she calls the house, and my grandpa, of course, answers and commands the caller on the other, uh, other side to identify themselves, which was his custom, and she just said, hi, Dad, it's me. We broke down around the corner, and before she could even finish the, the statement, he said, where are you? I'm coming. And he hung up the phone, grabbed his tools. He was there. He fixed the car, of course, because that's what he did. And never even brought it up. It didn't even matter to him. He wasn't grumpy in any way. The only thing that he knew was that his child needed help, and it was his job to go and provide that help. So he got the car on the road, and he said, well, mom's back at home. She's got a hot meal for you. Why don't you come back there? Let's eat together, and then you can go home after that. They never, ever, ever spoke of that particular argument ever again. Now, years later, as she was analyzing all of this, she finally became, finally was able to understand that this was her dad's only way that he knew to show love, and he showed it unconditionally. His, his aid in this way, helping his children, he, they never, ever needed to pay him anything in any way, either with favors or words or compliments or anything. If they needed the help, they got it. She kind of got to this place where all of the words actually didn't mean anything because she had this giant body of evidence, just 40, 50 years of evidence of him going out of his way for his kids over and over and over again. The actions at that point meant more than anything else. She could see the love of God, and that's the only evidence that she needed. No words necessary at all. So how does this relate to the early church? Well, it's the only tool that they had. It was their actions. That's the only thing that they could do to spread the gospel. So their actions became their habits, their gut reflexes, their default mode of interaction. Their witness was their actions. Their way of evangelism was their actions. Sometimes it meant that they took a loss at work. It cost them money. Sometimes it meant doing things for people that they didn't like. A lot of times it meant doing things for people that they didn't like. Sometimes it meant that they would have to do something for somebody that would later turn them in to go and be a part of those gladiator games, to be executed in in a very public and gruesome way. This really is what church persecution looks like. And they were really able to overcome that strictly through their public witness. What ended up happening as time went on is that they became the pillars of their community. People that were putting on these games and these executions or politicians, the people in in their community just became disgusted with what was happening. Because they're looking at these people that actually didn't do anything wrong that were the best aspects of their community, and they were like, we can no longer do this. This is wrong, and it stopped. And that's, that's a really powerful thing just by living out the commandments of the Bible. Matthew 5, through 48 says, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives you, or for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect perfect. Something that really helps me a lot in scripture is to kind of paraphrase things for myself. I find that sometimes when I'm reading through the Bible, things aren't easily understandable um, for me in particular. And sometimes it helps me to just kind of look 
and what's happening globally and then come up with a different way to state it that maybe has a little bit more meaning. So this is the one that I did for this one. It says, do things that cost you something that will bless your enemy and hope that good things will happen to them. That's pretty uncomfortable, actually. It's pretty uncomfortable because there's, there's no conditions on this. Jesus doesn't say that you do that, you know, a couple of times and then you stop and, and, until they earn it. He doesn't say that you only need to do it once or twice, it's forever. In fact, later on in Matthew, his, he says that when somebody asks him how, how often they should forgive their brother, he says seven, he's, uh, has seven times, he says, no, it's 70 times seven. Over and over and over again. In fact, you, you don't even count. If someone shows unconditional love over and over and over again, what? is your opinion going to be of that person? First of all, you're, you're going to want whatever that is. You're going to want to be a part of that. That's the way that it works. Really what ended up happening is, like we said, it, it turned the tide of the church. It completely transformed the government's view on the church. Shifted and changed. It molded the way that the church was inside of the community, inside of the world at large. And it really got to the point where when somebody would come to these people and they would say, what makes you so different? And they would say, Jesus. And they would say, how do I get that too? They didn't need any convincing because remember the, the actions are the root systems. They're the body of evidence of what it means to be committed to Jesus and showing the love of God. We kind of live in a world where information is freely accessible and we can, com we can actually really over-communicate now. And that sort of becomes our default mode of things. Well, why would I you know, take all this time to go and, and do this the hard way when I could just say the thing and then walk away from it? Well, the thing about that is that it's actually kind of, that's kind of a, 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 a more affordable way to do that, shall we say. It's a cheap way to do that. The more expensive, the more investing thing is to continuously invest in people's lives, to do difficult things for them, to do things that make us uncomfortable. Something that I've been thinking about for the last couple of days is that there are a lot of messages that exist in the world um, that I have had the privilege of preaching. There are some times that you're, as you're thinking about things, there's something that's stirring inside of you that like can't wait to get out. It's like almost bubbling over. And sometimes these ideas percolate for a really long time and you're super excited. Now, this is an idea that's been percolating for a long time inside of me, but this is not really one a message that I wanted to give. Um, it's actually a really terrible sermon to give because I believe it. And if I believe it, really more than anything else, it means that I have to live it out. And that's pretty inconvenient, actually. Think about the ramifications here. Like, if, if we can avoid having these relationships, then we, we don't... We don't, we're kind of off the hook. Think of all the people that we can avoid having relationships if we don't, uh, don't do this. All of the people that we can keep from the love of God if we don't do this. We can effectively serve as the gatekeeper for a really awesome club. We get to decide who's in and who's out if we don't do this. It's actually not our role. Our role is to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can't really love people from afar. We can't really love people disconnected. We have to love them directly, and we have to be involved with them. 
we have to pray that they'll come to, we, we, we would like to pray that they would come to know God through some other means, but it's really us that are the ones that need to do that. To take an active role, and that really means with the people that are close to us, with the people that are a little bit disconnected from us, the people that we like, and really the thing that, that Jesus tends to drill down is with the people that we don't like, with the people that don't look like us in any way, the people that we can't identify with, the people that we're so foreign to, the people at work that when they walk in the room, it turns your stomach and you wish that they would just please go work anywhere else but here. Those are the people. That's not something that I really want to do. But it's the thing that we're actually called to do. This last thing I think is, whenever something that comes, like, comes up like this, I always get somebody that will come to me and they will try to bring up the exception. Like I've got this one family member and they continuously hurt people and they steal and they do all of these things. Surely there we are exempt from loving those people because they've already burned up all of their chances. And the thing that I would say to that is that when I started thinking about this, there were names that popped up immediately in my head. The ones that I very specifically didn't want to love. And as I've thought about this for several months, I've kind of come to believe that those are the ones that I need to go out and love the most. Sometimes with those people, it means letting them hit rock bottom before we can come to their aid because that's what they need. That may be the case. Regardless, our prayers for those people need to be that good things and positive things would happen to them, that they would really see the love of God and that we would be the ones that would be able to show that to them by loving them unconditionally, by scooping them up when they need it, as, as uncomfortable as that may be. Because if we only love the people that already love us, we're not really doing anything. We have to love the people that we're disconnected from. We have to love the people that are different from us, the people that we're uncomfortable with, maybe even, uh, really even the people that we don't like. We're coming to the time of year where we're doing, we're all coming up with our New Year's resolutions, and it's usually things for, you know, we're going to go to the gym, we're going to eat more healthy and we're all going to stop doing that thing on about January 15th. I think this is something that we can start slowly and we can really ramp it up. And this is something that really gives us an opportunity to truly change the world around us. And so I want to challenge us today. I want to challenge us for the year to make this a part of our lives, to go out and love people, love in a way that's going to cost you something so that they see the love of God unconditionally and they say, I want that for my life. How do I reflect that too? Think about how much better the world would be if we were all doing that. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, this is... Um, this is a very difficult topic for us to discuss. And I confess this is not something that I wanted to talk about today. I would have rather talked about any other things. God, for myself and the rest of the North Hills community, for the rest of the church globally, for all of the believers, God, I just ask that you would impress it upon us to continue to love in this way, to start loving in this way. God, I ask that you would give us daily reminders of ways that we can change our actions and our habits and our public witness so that when people say, I need help with something, let me go find one of those people that believe in Jesus because I really know that those people will help me. Father, help us really become the light of the world and help us be the hope for humanity. In your name we pray, amen.
Blessings, North Hills family. Have a wonderful week.